Sagara's trial is finally underway, 34 years after his killing. It's being presided over by a military tribunal and 14 men stand accused. It started on the 11th of October, but there's now a two week postponement, which was granted until next week, Monday, the 25th, because the defense lawyers claimed they needed some time to prepare and peruse over the thousands of documents which was produced by the prosecuting team. So when someone is watching these events unfold, I think a natural thought that comes across one's mind is how did this process come together and how the hell is it only happening now? You have to remember that Blaise Compare was in power for 27 years after the murder of Thomas Sankara. And so every effort to investigate the assassination was blocked by the Compare regime. I mean, it wasn't, and it wasn't until, say, 10 years after Sankara's murder, uh, finally in 1997, that the process started when Mariam Sankara got a lawyer, Benewind Sankara, who had been working with opposition figures um, in Burkina Faso. Until then, that things started, right? Um, but every effort was, was blocked by the Compare regime. We know that, for example, it wasn't until 2008 that Sankara's uh, death certificate was changed um, from saying that he died of natural causes to something else. Uh, it wasn't finally until 2014, October of 2014, that things started really in, in sort of with, in good faith um, in terms of an investigation into the murder of Sankara and his companions. Um, and that was after Kampara had been overthrown. So it took that long to really get things started. Um, and then it took off during that year, during the interim government under Kafando, ironically enough. Um, uh, and they almost put the kibosh on it in September. You remember, Ble I'm sorry, uh, Gilbert Diendere's coup of what, September 16th, 2015, the day before they're about to make some announcements about the investigation to Sankara's murder. Um, he staged a coup, right? Overthrew the government, put himself on the throne for a week, and then finally that was overturned uh, due to popular pressure and mobilization in the streets. Um, and then it really began in earnest. So from that point on now, it's been six years, right? And so they've done interviews with people, they've had depositions, France has forwarded some documents. Um, and so now they've marshaled enough evidence um, under the leadership of um, uh, the judge, uh, Francois Yamayogo, uh, to finally have a trial, right, of these individuals. And like you said, there are 14 people, right, who are on trial. Uh, many of them were accomplices. Most of them were low-level, I would say, commandos, right, who were actually involved in the military components of the operation. Then you have people like Blaise Compora being tried in absentia as an accomplice to murder, threatening uh, state security, things of that nature. You have the doctor, Jean Diebre, who is being charged with falsifying a death certificate. Um, you have people like um, who, uh, Jean Pierre Palm, who was the head of who was the gendarmerie. So you have a, a list of important people, including Gendere, right, who's been in prison since, uh, well, since he was arrested in 2015, but now he's sentenced to 20 years. He's probably going to spend the rest of his life in prison, as will well, his wife was, was sentenced to 30 years. I think she's still at large. But um, So you have some of the main actors. Blaze is going to escape justice for the most part. Many of the people who are implicated in are already dead or they fled or they were murdered. Um, France will not be touched, right? Any foreign powers are involved in the assassination will not be brought to justice. That's a difficult thing to do. Um, but that's how I would just frame it initially as a sort of the, the overview of the process from 19, from October 15th, 1987 to present. And it took, it took place, right, on Blaise's watch, Blaise Campari's watch, continually stopping uh, the process from moving forward. And uh, Lassan can uh, certainly uh, remind us the difficulties, of, difficulties of doing research on Sankara at the time. I mean, you, you know, pictures of Sankara were abolished. You know, he was virtually erased from memory. Uh, you couldn't talk about him. You know, I mean, so it, it was, a, it was a, a reality where Sankara did not exist. He existed at the grassroots level in people's memories. So there, so there was that living archive of Sankara alive in people's minds. But you know, you couldn't go to the market and find pictures of him or books or or audio cassettes of his speeches or things of that nature. That stuff was just abolished. It was banned, right? So slowly things opened up, but but for the most of that history, yeah, Sankara was erased from public culture. Uh, absolutely. Over the times um, to even see a public display of uh, Sankara, anything related to Sankara is just 
uh, something that you wouldn't see in Burkina Faso. And right. when you talk to people in private sphere, they are likely to open to talk to you about it. But um, in uh, um, in privacy, they will talk about it, um, but they will never accept to be quoted or um, said anything about it at all. So that says a lot about how over the 27 years uh, after his assassination, the Compaore regime was able to suppress um, his image in the public sphere, but also um, they were able to sort of uh, lead people into a certain complete silence. So elsewhere outside of Burkina Faso, you will hear people talk about Sankara. Um, but in Burkina, you will not hear, um, uh, with the exception of a few musicians who uh, would often quote his him in the lyrics. And those were not the popular guys. Those are people who were considered renegades. 